to just confirm with a quick message in the chat that you can uh, hear me. We are about to start. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's get started. I see people, um, you know, are still uh, joining, but um, I think we can uh, um, we can already start. You know, we have a little introduction, and we are very excited to have also like you know um, experts, guests um, that will help us today better understand how to interpret, how to use, and what are. Uh, flood forecast. So I'm Leonardo uh, Milano. I'm working for the UNOCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, and uh, I'm leading the uh, the predictive analytics team that has been working, you know, doing a lot of work in trying to integrate forecasts in the way humanitarians, you know, act and take decisions, and then you know, um, trigger um, humanitarian actions. So let's get, you know started immediately with just a quick introduction. I guess you know, most of you are familiar with the work of, uh, of OCHA. And just a few words before introducing uh, our guests about the center. So the center has been established with the clear goal of increasing the use and the impact of data in humanitarian response. And that's exactly why today we organize this webinar to help you and give you some tools and insights, you know, about how to integrate specifically, you know, flood forecast, but more broadly, you know, data around uh, climate shocks. We just had another workshop on precipitation forecast three weeks ago. So that's the second uh, webinar, uh, you know, focusing on flood forecast. Just, you know, um, in terms of housekeeping, um, you, uh, I see that participants have already found the chat box. So whenever you have questions, just put them in the chat. I'll keep track of all the questions and then we have time for uh, Q and A throughout the presentation. Um, also, um, don't be, yeah, don't be shy. I mean, this is really like an opportunity to ask questions and we are very lucky today to have uh to have our guests that will uh, help us uh in this uh, in this task so let me then go straight to the um to the introduction of our uh speaker so from uh, uh wmo the war meteorological organization we have tanya gascon that is the technical coordinator on flood forecasting early warning systems and climate risk um so tanya over to you to say hi Hello everyone, nice to meet you. Thank you for the invitation. Great. And also uh, from uh, uh, Google, the Flood Forecasting Initiative, we have Gray Nierig, that is the research scientist at Google Research. Hi, Gray, thanks for joining today. <clears throat> okay, so what's coming up um, in today's webinar? You know, you see it here in the, in the session overview. So first of all, uh, we asked, uh, Tanya and Gray to give us an overview of what is flood forecasting, what are the, the main types of floods, um, and then uh, also like to help us sort of like giving, you know, some uh, um, ideas on where to find the data, what type of indicators are available, what are the lead times and the specific features of the different forecasts. Then we have some time, you know, for discussion, Q&A, and in the second part of the webinar, we are really we have designed some scenarios and some practical exercises to help you really like you know figuring out how you can you know take decisions and make recommendations based on the uh, the you know specific uh, products that will be uh, introduced. So um, before we get started and leaving the work to uh, uh, the, leaving the floor to Tanya. Can I ask you to just write, a, you know, um, your name, organization, and title in the chat so that, you know, it's also as a way to um, uh, introduce yourself. And if there's anything specifically that you would like to hear, you know, to learn about during today's workshop, if you want to already, like, put it in the chat so that, you know, we'll make sure to, to cover that topic. Okay, but you know, without further ado, let's get started with uh, um, you know an introduction from uh, uh, Tanya on flood forecasting. Thank you, Tanya. Over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, um, Leonardo, for this opportunity. So, Tom, okay. So, Tom, now we are going to, to dedicate a few minutes to talk uh, about the flooding, type of flooding, um, flow forecasting. So, Tom, let's first see how a float um, is defined by the WMO and UNESCO Glossary of Hydrology. So, according to this, a flooding is a, an overflowing by water of the normal confine of a water courses or other body of water. So, to also they define a flooding as an accumulation of drainage water over areas which are not normally submerged. So, the, and what is the, how they define flow forecasting? So the, they are defined that as a prediction of the stage for water level, the sharp type of occurring and duration of a flow, especially of the peak of flow at one specific point in the stream. So the wish is result from a precipitation for precipitation or a snow smell. So the, there are two things that we need to keep in mind. So the, First of all, is that uh, it's necessary to estimate the type of flow and sorry, the peak of flow and the type, the time in which this peak of flow arrives. So, to, and normally, so to, uh, the operational hydrological service are, that are the implementing hydrological forecasting, so they are providing this information. So, but. Uh, so the, these the operational centers are not providing information related with the extension of flooding, which is really critical to take decisions. Next, please. So the, we have different type of flow who can be um, categorized by the, their dynamic, dynamic. So we have fast, Rapid flow associated with rapid dynamic, which can occur in few minutes, few hours. This type of flow are generally associated to rapid, uh, to uh, convec convective uh, rainfall. So, to, uh, and uh, normally we need to uh, take uh, into consideration that uh, uh, the, the national. Um, Operational, sorry, the National Hydrological Survey need to provide this information in advance to civil protection or other disaster agencies, but uh, uh, that is quite challenged. So normally they are no um, uh, often well prepared to provide this time of information. So we have also a slow flow related with a slow dynamic. So this type of flow are more related with the um, with the rightness of uh, water level, so to associate with seasonal behavior. So most of the hydrological centers that are the, able to provide this type of information. So, and this type of flow can occur in few days, few hours, but normally few days. So, to, and it allow to hydrological service to provide information to civil protection or disaster risk agency so in advance to prepare all the, what is necessary um, to assist population in case of the uh, occurring of events. Next, please. So the, we have here a classification of different type of flow. So the, we have a fluvial or riverine flooding. We have also flash flow or Cost of flow, which are classified as the main type of flow. So it means the flow that are producing more damage in the population. We have also other type of flow uh, classified as urban or fluvial, glacial or tidal flow. So to, here we can show the um, survey, the result of a survey who was uh, carried out by UN University. So in this survey, we can see that uh, around 29% uh, of 
float are associated to fluvial, and 20% 20, 20 float are associated to flash float. There are also other types of float so that, have, uh, are, that are very frequently. So the and is the urban flow who um, are categorized as a 20%. So the, please next. Okay, let's to see so the, a bit more about the dynamic of this, the main type of flow. So the, the, the river flow, they are associated with the capaci capacity of the, of the channel of it can be natural or artificial to retain the volume in the channel. And they are associated to a strength to, um, to continue rainfall, snow smell, and the evolution is normally slow. So the related with flash flow, they are associated with heavy rainfall. So it can be also convection storm. And normally this type of flow occur in a short duration, minutes or hours. So and in a small area, and they are producing rapid flow. We have also other type of flow that uh, we can um, that um, classify as coastal flow. So the, they are the, uh, normally produced for a storm surge, so and high wind. So the, and they are a result of raising of sea level and the return flow from the coastal area. So understanding the dynamic of this type of flow will help better to monitor and forecast them. Okay, so let's see how the flows are monitored or estimated. So Tom, it's necessary to really monitor uh, in real time a flow is necessary to have local observation, so the, and also forecasting, for instance, forecasting of precipitation, and also um, observation from the water level or stream flow. This observation from the water level or stream flow is going to allow so to, to compare to validate uh, one forecaster in real time. So the, also. What is necessary so is conduct simulation. So the numerical simulation, statistical, statistical in, uh, simulation, etc. Uh, for the simulation, so normally it's necessary to um, predict, uh, forecast uh, the stream flow or the river discharge that is going to happen in a near future. So the, and also it's very useful so to understand the extension of the flow. Nevertheless, this information, as I mentioned initially, is not normally produced or provided by the National Hydrological Service. So, to, and also the duration of this, the, um, this flooding. So, to, related with impact measure. So, to, uh, Leonardo mentioned at the beginning that the, um, the team uh, is the interest in increase the use of, of impact data related with uh, flow forecasting. So to, um, normally uh, in, in a lot of countries in which I work in, the information of impact of uh, flow to flooding is not collected. So, to, but this information is, is essential. So understanding the damage understanding the duration, the duration of the impact, understanding uh, if people accept what impact, help to better plan, to better prepare, to better take decision for future flow. Next, please. Okay, let's to see a bit more about uh, the forecasting, the different type of forecasting. So the, the river, the, the forecasting associated to river inflow. So the, most of the country in the world are familiar with this type of this type of forecasting. 
So to, and uh, the performance in the, my collaboration with many countries, I saw that the, the performance of this type of forecasting can be considered moderate. So to, um, and the main information that is necessary is precipitation, so to, um, uh, weather forecasting, but also local precipitation and stream flow, as I mentioned, uh, for real time validation. And also, it's important to emphasize that historical data is also uh, super important to better perform, to better adjust all time of the uh, system for forecasting. So to, this uh, type of forecasting uh, is ingesting the precipitation to produce or to reproduce hydrological condition in Cashman. So to, and uh, um, it's the pain of the uh, time of response of the basin. So, but uh, normally the idea is that this type of forecasting can be um, can be provided uh, in few hours and also with a projection to few days to better take decisions. So, next, please. So, relating with with um, to flash flow. So the um, WMO is providing a support for several to several countries, more than 60 countries, in which they facilitate solutions uh, to monitor and take a decision related with flash flow warming. But generally, so the access of this type of forecasting is limited. So to, um, based on collaboration that WMO have with countries, we understood that the performance of this type of forecasting is moderate. Uh, for that, it's necessary near real-time precipitation. So, to, for instance, precipitation that comes from radar, but uh, also is uh, possible um, to use the satellite information to monitor and also uh, to provide information related with flash flow. Normally, uh, this type of float uh, um, depend of the behavior of the catchment, mainly of this uh, soil moisture capability. So to, and the, show, the, the leak time is very short. So to, this even can, can occur in few, uh, in few hours. It can be between one or seven hours. Next, please. So for cost of flow, flow to, so the, this type of forecasting uh, is the quite limited. So to, um, in the case of WMO support, so there are some pilot um, regions, regions that are support to improve capability on coastal flooding. So, the, but there are also countries um, as United States or um, Australia who have uh, tools in place to, uh, to monitor and to provide information on coastal float. Uh, is the, what I can say right now is that um, the performance, so it's not well known right now, of this uh, uh, globally, you know, of this forecasting, and it's very challenged to provide information on coastal flow. The best is the, uh, that countries can be well prepared so to, for this type of flow and uh, um, so to the National Hydrological and Meteorological Service, service need to work together with uh, um, civil protection and disaster management agents. Um, so the, the main information that is necessary for this type of flow is precipitation, wind, and maritime condition. So to, and this flow can't arrive uh, in few hours. To, um, it's possible that we identify the conditions and the flow to, can arrive in 48 hours, for instance. Next, please. Okay, let's to focus on um, river, river float, but a uh, um, bit of that, um, one of the main challenge that uh, countries are uh, suffering is the, um, getting data to provide uh, 
flow forecasting. So to, speci specifically, um, precipitation data. So, to, um, and also there is a, a big issue in, in developing countries related with the uh, historical information, the, the real time data. So, to, WMO uh, is working with global designated centers uh, for the data processing and forecasting system. So, to, and this, uh, this center are providing the, um, information to countries uh, related with uh, uh, climate variable and meteorological variable. So they may available meteorological information to better support monitoring and forecasting. So to currently there is the, um, um, a new activity that is the, uh, ongoing in which the, uh, is planning to integrate a uh, uh, center for hydrology. For hydrology, because until now, so it's only centers related with climate, meteorological, and uh, other environmental uh, variables. So, next, please. We can see that uh, a part of the center who are providing, who are officially designated, and who are providing uh, um, information at like regional or global scale. So the, there are other institutions, organizations that are working to provide information to support uh, hydrological forecasting, hydrological monitoring and forecasting. We have an example of GLOFAS, so to, who, is, who is providing in global information to support um, hydrological monitoring, so to, and uh, uh, to support um, decisions related with flow forecasting. So to, um, we have also an example called Erisha, uh, which, which is providing the, over Europe rainfall induced hazard assessment, so to, to support also um, analysis decisions of uh, the countries in Europe. So in West Africa, there is the assistant called Fanfar who provide flow forecasting information for the 70 countries. So, to, and uh, um, also supported by WMO, there is a flash flow guidance system that is providing over Niger, Burkina, Faso, and Mali flash flow information to support warning decisions also. And we can see also that there are other initiative at local level as SLAPIS. So to, in SLAPIS, to, so to, um, the partners to, um, are providing flow risk scenarios to, in a small basin called La Sirva. So to, and this initiative facilitate cooperation between National Hydrological Center Service, National Meteorological Service, and civil protection. So, and they are initiating um, in this moment uh, actions related uh, to the integration of impact based forecasting. So, uh, uh, in this basin. Thank you very much, Leonardo. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. So, thank you very much. So, and um, so if you have questions, um, just put them in the chat. I see already a question from uh, Roberto. It's coming soon. Um, a climate guide for uh, for flood forecasting. So, and I will mention, you know, some of the work that we're doing. But just to recap, for those that already like attended, you know, the webinar on precipitation forecast, you see that so it's similar. So we have information coming, you know, from global data providers, you know, like regional, and then down to local level, and sort of like the best we can do as humanitarians is really try to understand what are the, the key elements that we can take, you know, from these different tools and how to integrate in the, in the decision-making process. And that's exactly what, uh, what we're going to talk about uh, in a moment. Um, don't be shy, you know, this is your opportunity to have, you know, really like an expert available. So if you have questions on the type of floods, you know, 
uh, data availability and so on, please put them in the chat. We'll go to, we have a first Q and A session in a moment. So, but before doing that, let me uh, leave the floor to Gray that is going to talk about, you know, like a different type of modeling approach that has been developed by uh, colleagues at, uh, at Google. And uh, yeah, over to you, uh, Gray. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks also for the chance to be here. It's great to speak with you all, and I'm happy to take questions later. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, I'm just going to give a very brief and high level overview of how uh, riverine flood modeling usually works. And I'm going to use the Google flood model as an example, but it is just an example. And I'll, at the end, I don't have a slide prepared, but at the end, I'll, I'll give a few more examples that uh, of global scale uh, flood forecasting systems that people in this audience might be interested in. So, but let me just give a little bit of a background on how um, these flood forecasts are produced. And I'm specifically talking about riverine floods. Uh, that's basically all I'm gonna talk about today. Coastal floods and flash floods are quite different things and uh, they're modeled in, in significantly different ways. Um, but for riverine floods, basically there's broadly speaking, a three-step process. One is building a hydrologic model, and the job of the hydrologic model is to take rainfall data and turn it into estimates of how much water is coming out of a watershed, so how much water is in the river. Um, that can be done in many, many different ways. There's a whole history, at least going back 75, maybe more years, of computer modeling uh, of hydrological systems, of watersheds, but again, the basic idea is you get an estimate of rainfall, maybe a time series, maybe a history of rainfall, and maybe a forecast of rainfall from a weather forecasting model. And the job of the hydrologic model is to use that data to estimate how much water is going to be in a river. After you do that, then you, you, can, you can use an inundation model. And an inundation model takes a lot of information, but one of the pieces of information it takes is the amount of water that's forecasted to be in a river, and it estimates the spatial extent of flooding. So it creates a map of where places might be inundated or flooded or covered with water. And there are sort of two variables that we might want to predict with an inundation model. One is the extent of where of places that are going to be covered in water, and one is the depth of water in those places. So that's basically the goal, uh, the, the role of the inundation model is to, is to take the output of a hydrologic model, how much water is coming out of the watershed, most usually through a river, and turn it into spatial maps of areas that are going to be flooded. And then, of course, the last piece of a good flood forecasting system is distributing warnings. So how do we get that information to people? And I think my, my guess is, although I, I, I haven't been formally introduced to the people listening to this, but my guess is most people in the audience are interested in using the information that are coming out of flood uh, forecasting models. And if uh, if that guess is correct, then, you know, there are different ways that we can get information to people, uh, both people in NGOs and, and uh, government organizations, like I see several of, of the audience members are from, or also just directly to people, like we can push information to people's cell phones. This is done by water agencies all over the world, including in the United States, where I'm from. The water agency will send alerts to people's cell phones. Uh, we can put these on interactive maps that people use on the internet. We can put them on places like Google search and stuff like that. But anyway, there's lots of ways to distribute this information, but uh, arguably I'm a hydrologist by training and arguably the hardest part is not the hydrology. It's the uh, stuff that I think people in this room probably do more of, which is getting information to people in a way that's useful. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so a hydrology model kind of works like this. You divide the world up into watersheds. That's the center picture in the middle. Watersheds are defined, I guess everyone knows, by topography. It's a watershed is defined as the area of land where all of the water the rainfall that falls on that area of land goes to the same river or stream. So you divide the, divide the world up spatially into these watersheds and you model each of these watersheds. Again, that can be done in numerous ways. You can use physically based models. You can use gridded models that then aggregate to watersheds. You can use conceptual models, which are kind of simplified representations of watersheds. What we do here at Google is we use AI or artificial intelligence machine learning models. Uh, we don't have any physics in our models, but it's just one of many ways to model this process. And then the inputs to these models, no, really no matter what kind of model they are, are geophysical and geographical characteristics of that watershed. Those are things like vegetation cover, topography, soil type, 
uh, human influence and climate variables. What is the ambient or, or historical climate in those watersheds? And then they also take dynamic variables or meteorological forcing variables. Those are things like rainfall, um, radiation, temperature, air pressure, humidity variables. These things usually come out of weather forecasting models and they're put into the hydrological model, which is run at every watershed at whatever scale you're running your model. And then the output will be hopefully either an estimate of stream flow or even better will be a probability distribution over what the stream flow will be like from now into up through some forecast horizon. And just as an example, uh, the Google model goes up to seven days in the future. We do daily stream flow up to seven days in the future. These things can be run at hourly time step, sub daily time step, daily time step, and they go out a few days or weeks, although out about more than about a week, this is really rough and it depends on the model, but more than about a week, you're getting skills, predictive skills that are around the, the uh, skill of climatology or persistence. Um, so the models really add value, mo most value up to up to about a week out, but that can be extended with a, with a really good model and good modeling team. Okay, next slide, please. So, when we're training these models, and this is true for our model at Google, and it's also true for the ECMWF, the European model, uh, GLOFAST, which is on the last slide of, of Tanya's presentation, uh, these things really rely on open source data sets. They really rely on, on streamflow uh, data sets so that we can calibrate or train the models. So we say we calibrate a model if, it, if that model is a physically based model, if it represents the physical processes of the watershed. We train a model if it's a machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, model, but these are really the same, the same concept, calibrating and training. Basically, we just take the model, we tune the parameters so that the model gives results that match what we actually see on the ground. And in order to do that, what, what, what does it mean what we see on the ground? It means we have to have stream flow data, and we like to have lots of stream flow data that covers as much of the world as possible. So this uh, slide shows the stream flow data that's available through the Global Runoff Data Center, which is out of Germany. It's a WMO funded or a WMO um, uh, effort uh, that's housed in Germany. And this is sort of the world's best collection of open stream flow data that people can use to uh, train and calibrate their models. And this is what mostly a large part of what the ECMWF, the European model uses. That's the GLOFAST model, and it's it's. Um, we use it also in some of our research setting. So one of the points that I want to emphasize is that if you have stream flow data in the area that you care about, then it may or may not be in some of these global open data sets. And if it's not in some of these global open data sets, then it's really worth your time to work with a hydrology modeling group that can take that data and either add it to an existing model or create a model with that data because the models are much, much higher quality and the, for the forecasts are much higher quality in places where there's data, both historical data to train the model on and real-time data to use uh, as you make forecasts in real time. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, one back, yeah. Okay, and what does an inundation model do? It looks something like this. So this is actually an image of our inundation model at Google, but inundation models work in lots of different ways. So what is what is this model doing in particular? What we do at Google is we take satellite-derived images of flood extents, usually from optical and uh, radar satellites, SAR, synthetic aperture radar satellites. We take images of where we uh, satellites have seen floods before, and then we match those images with what we our model estimates is the river discharge, the stream flow at that point in space and time. And we build a little neural network, a little machine learning model that says, okay, if we see river flows that are this high, whatever height it is, this is the area of land that we expect to be flooded. That works to some extent, and just, there are some problems with that. Landscapes change over time. Satellites don't always capture the peak of flood events, but this is the basic strategy for estimating inundation, uh, at least in the machine learning artificial intelligence world. There's another basic category of strategies for estimating uh, inundation, and that's using physics equations. So we can take the topography of the landscape and we can kind of just fill that topography up with water as more and more water comes out of the river. We can kind of just fill that landscape up and we can kind of know from where the high and low points are on the landscape, what areas are gonna be flooded and are covered in water and which aren't. Both of these strategies have pluses and minuses. The physically based strategy works where we don't have satellite data and, and the satellite uh, 
but the satellite uh, approach is better able to detect recent changes in the landscape. So we see large problems in these approaches when, for example, someone cuts an irrigation channel uh, near a river that will cause flooding to go in sort of a completely different direction. We've seen cases where entirely different villages are flooded just because of the someone decided to cut an irrigation channel out of the river. And there's no way to know that unless you're actually on the ground uh, looking at all these uh, human influence changes to the to the watershed or if you can see it from satellites. So inundation mapping is a is a, actually a very hard problem and there are several research groups around the world working on it but most global or most uh, uh, flood forecasting models have some type of inundation model attached to them. Okay next slide. Okay, so this is kind of what, this is the Google Flood Hub. So this is where you can get information from the Google model. And I'm using this as an example because I know it well, but most of the uh, fl global flood forecasting systems have an interface that looks something more or less like this. So uh, you can get, by the way, just uh, as a little pitch for, for Google, you, you can go to the g.co flood hub, this web address that's down in the bottom uh, left hand corner of the screen g.co flood hub and you can get all of our flood forecasts for free in real time and you can use that for whatever you want. Uh, you're welcome to go there now or anytime and you can kind of see uh, where we're predicting floods and where where we make predictions. Those are the green dots. This uh, screenshot is quite old actually. We've launched in North America and several more places that aren't here. I should have updated this. But um, green is where we make uh, we make predictions Yellow is where we're making predictions and we see that the stream flow is above a two year return period, meaning it's above a level where we would expect to see on average once every two years. And red is where we're above a five year return period. So this is where we think the stream flow is, is quite high. And you can kind of zoom in on this. Can we go to the next slide? You can kind of zoom in on one of these locations and see a little hydrograph, a little prediction out for the past couple days and then out going out to the next seven days. This little cartoon prediction over on the right kind of says how our model expects the stream flow to develop over the next seven days in this particular catchment in Sweden, with, uh, Sweden, yep, which is currently above what we're calling a danger level. That's the level that we expect the river to be at maximum once every five years on average. We see that it's kind of been that that high for a couple days and it's going to kind of decrease we expect it to decrease in the future and so if you go to any of these global flood forecasting systems uh, like the ones that Tanya showed and a couple more that I'll mention here just just in a second you'll you'll see an interface that looks kind of like this and then some of them allow you to download data and some of them allow you just to look at things in real time but you can kind of go to your area and see what's what's going on um, yeah, and there were just as long as we're talking about options. Um, I'm not here to sort of advertise the Google model, although again, you're welcome to use it. It's free, it's public, it's open. It's never, you're, it's completely available for anyone to use. Um, and if you're interested in an area that we don't currently cover, if there's not a little green dot over an area that a river that you would like to see covered, uh, you're welcome to reach out to me and we can work on um, getting that into the system. The reason we don't cover every river in the world is because we um, we actually make predictions everywhere in the world, but we only release predictions where we're really confident in our skill because we don't want to give bad forecasts. Some of the government run models like the ECMWF model, um, well, some of them, not, not ECMWF, that's not true. Some of the other models that run global models, they will actually make predictions everywhere and then you can use them at your own risk. And that's a really good system. Um, to, to work for, but the Google model uh, to work under, but the Google model is specifically, we only release predictions where we're relatively confident in the skill of our predictions. Um, I'll just list a couple of other models that I really, I really like. Um, besides the ECMWF model, ECMWF is the European Center for Medium uh, Range Weather Forecasting. They have a model called GLOFAS. And there's a group in the United States out of Brigham Young University that produces a model called GeoGlose, which uses uh, not the not the ECMWF product that I just mentioned, but a different ECMWF product to produce flood forecasts glo globally. That's GeoGlows, and they have a great uh, website and interface that you can go and look at their predictions. And there's a model out of Sweden called the Hype model, which makes uh, really nice global predictions that you can also go and, and look at any time. So there's a sort of a suite of these global models available. So if you don't have a local flood forecasting model, or agency in your area, or you there is one, but you're, it's very hard to get the data from, which has been our experience. 
with working with a lot of uh, flood forecasting agencies around the world, uh, there are these global models that are kind of popping up and you have a wide variety to choose from uh, based on, and you can use them all or, or one or, or whatever you like. Anyway, I'm happy to talk more about that. I'm sorry I didn't prepare a slide on options of globally available flood forecasting models, but I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Gray. So can I ask you whenever you have a moment to put like the links to the two models, to the global models that you mentioned in the chat, just for reference. Okay, so we have um, some time for uh, Q&A. So please post your questions in the in the chat. I have already seen one um, that I think it's mainly, um, you know, for uh, for you, Gray. And uh, um, it's about sort of like, yeah, what, you know, this specific model takes into account. So, and the question is whether this model takes into account uh, water surface runoff or only river inflow. So what is really like the, the, you know, the type of events that this model is expected to, uh, to predict. And maybe it would be good, I don't know, just for, you know, for everyone to, I don't know if you or Tanya actually can uh, say a couple of sentences on uh, sort of like the challenges and the differences with respect to flash flood prediction models. That is, you know, um, as Tanya said at the beginning, much more challenging. Thank you. So I'll just take the first part of that. Um, since you mentioned my name, uh, sorry, Tanya, to jump in. The, um, the models that I'm talking about are really about the green floods and not flash floods. And so I want to make two distinctions. One is flash floods, which happen, uh, it's, there's several definitions of flash floods, but one is what happens when there's intense heavy rainfall. It might be in an upstream uh, headwater basin, or it may be in a city with a lot of impervious areas, but floods that develop very rapidly and are not caused by an overflow of, uh, from the stream. And then I also, I want to distinguish that between um, uh, floods that are caused by uh, rain, rain hitting the ground and running off to the stream. So this is uh, th these can these are very closely related things, but they don't necessarily have to be the same. And the way that there there's actually uh, different modeling strategies if you think about these things in different from those two perspectives. If you look at what NOAA does in the United States, they have a flash flood warning system. And they don't actually try to model flash floods. What they do is they create a risk map of flash floods. And the risk map is a combination of a base map, which are say these locations around the United States are especially susceptible to flash floods. And then every day they get the meteorology forecasts and they say they combine that with some statistical formula with this base map of, of, of static risk. And they create a risk map for the United States for that day of flash flood uh, to provide flash flood guidance. Um, that's a little bit different than actually modeling how the rainfall hits the ground and then runs off to the stream. And that can be, uh, there, are, there are many groups around the world that does that do that, but I'm not aware of any that release their forecast publicly, uh, especially through a web-based interface. Yeah. Thank you, Leonardo, for the question. And I um, agree with uh, the comments that uh, were made by Gray. So to, um, um, to emphasize that, uh, so uh, um, the river inflow uh, floodings uh, are related with a slower dynamic. So uh, um, it means that the water level in the river is increasing slowly. So to, and the flash flood, they are more linking to extreme precipitation events. So it can happen in few hours. So to, uh, and uh, the approach the mechanism to analyze and to monitor to monitor that are differently. So um, um, I would like to to under because the, uh, what I saw uh, in this presentation is very promising. So um, I would like to to understand a bit more about what is the the um, plan uh, to better teach artificial intelligence in region in which we have a uh, lack of data because normally your your system depends uh, of analyzing what is there so taking into consideration historical behavior so to produce the, uh, information 
for the future. So what is the plan for this type of region with lack of data? Yeah, th Thank thanks, for, thanks for the question. So that's a really important question for, um, for AI-based modeling. Uh, and I, I just would say that uh, we have a, several like research papers in in science in peer reviewed journals on that question, and the takeaway is that AI modeling is actually quite accurate and surprisingly is able is it's actually better at at predicting in ungauged basins than physically based modeling. It's very surprising, but the the way that it works is that the AI model is trained on all the data in the world, not just one location, and because it kind of understands the hydrological conditions. And by that, I mean the geophysical catchment attributes like um, geology, climatology, vegetation, anthropogenic influence. It has all of this data. It's able to learn general rules about how rainfall runoff behaviors work in catchments kind of in that space. And so it's what we're finding through our research and benchmarking is that AI models are actually typically more accurate in ungauged basins than standard hydrology models are, even with engaged basins, even where there are data. We're much, we, there's a large skill gap. So uh, we do much, AI models do much worse in locations with no data than they do in locations with data. But because of this ability of AI to extrapolate over the whole world, the, the AI is, act, is able to make predictions at ungauged basins with accuracies that are you know, honestly, typically better than the standard hydrology models, even when those hydrology models are calibrated for that specific location, if that makes sense. That's, by the way, that's why we use AI. Like we didn't, we don't use AI just because we like it. We use it specifically because it's a powerful tool for making predictions in ungauged locations. Great. So, and so, I mean, without going into the tech, technical details, so maybe the last one before we move on um, maybe can you make a comment on um, um, that's mainly for you, Gray, I would say, on uh, sort of like the dissemination part, right? So how do we then send the warnings and we provide information? Well, keeping in mind that, you know, internet penetration may be an issue and especially, you know, during disasters, there may be issues and specific and also like, you know, for vulnerable populations, they may not have access to the tools needed. So is there, what's the thinking, you know, around sort of like the distribution of early warnings, specifically in, you know, very vulnerable context? So our, our thinking is, so I can speak for Google a little bit, and then I'll speak for myself. Um, Google got into flood forecasting because people come to Google to look for information about what's near them through search, through maps, uh, through alerts. So, so Google decided it needed to get into this space because people come to Google for information. But now that Google is in this space, the, the real central question is how do we reach more people and people that just like in communities, just like that you describe where uh, internet penetration is low or some communities we found are flooded with warnings or push alerts to cell phones. So our alerts don't come through and aren't, um, you know, it's hard to be seen. And so what we're, realizing is that it's really critical to have relationships with people on the ground, especially NGOs and government agencies like, like yours, um, that kind of work in specific areas and know specific areas. And what I think the most critical piece of large scale flood forecasting at this point is building relationships between the people that design the models and produce the data and people that need the data. And I think uh, I think that's the most important part. So your guys' jobs is much more important than my job. Um, and we would love to work with you to try to figure out what you need from what, what would make forecasts more valuable to you, how we can get them to you in a timely manner, and you know what people on the ground are able to do with those in terms of um, you know setting aside aid and like the, the WFP does or the USAID does or of uh, sending aid directly to people before events. Uh, this is the hardest part of the puzzle and it really requires people on the ground. Thanks. Okay, so I, and I think, you know, I see a question in the chat from William that is actually the perfect, you know, like uh, introduction to the next uh, part of the, of the webbing. So, we have learned about the science, we have learned about the different approaches, we have learned about the different types of flood. So now we would like to take you through sort of like a little exercise, 
just to kind of give you a sense and also work with uh, with Tanya and with Gray at the level of sort of like how do we interpret? How can we you know what are the insights that we can extract from the you know from the tools that are available? So um, in order to do this, so we'll do an overview of the tools that are uh, available again. Just put your um, uh, comments and questions in the chat. So this is really meant to be much more practical and to give you, you know, some overall sort of like guidelines or insights on, you know, sort of like how do you concretely use some of these tools. So let's go back in time. Let's imagine that, you know, uh, it's uh, 2022. And so we know, uh, you know, because, you know, of all the assessments and so on that, um, so we're going to focus for this exercise on uh, Niger. So Niger uh, was heavily affected by floods in uh, uh, 2022. You see uh, a snapshot from uh, a situation report at the end of the year by uh, Ocean Partners. So, you know, 366,000 uh, people affected. Uh, across, you know, several regions and so on. And I also tried, you know, from a satellite data provider to extract more or less the, the timeline. But roughly you see that the rain, you know, this, the overall timeline of, you know, a typical year in Niger and where you see sort of like the concentration of the, um, you know, of the flood risk during the rainy season. So now the little exercise that I want to do with you all today is really like, going, you know, sort of like back in time and see, you know, in 2022, what were the tools that we had available actually to sort of like already, you know, start anticipating. So the, the only, the key takeaway from this, you know, introduction to the actual event. So this is what actually happened. So this is really like number of affected people, observational data on flood extent, you know, the timeline that you see at the bottom, you see that you know, mainly the region in the southern part uh, uh, of the country were, uh, uh, were affected. So let's now uh, go back in time. So first of all, well before the beginning of the, of the risk season, the flood season, what we have at our disposal, and I'm sure that many of you have already like looked at some of these, uh, uh, these tools, we have static maps. These, you know, we can call them static maps or baseline uh, flood risk maps, assessments. But this is really like information that is available throughout the year. So this is information that is, you know, like available. It's calculated based on the frequency, the impact, the locations of, you know, past events and floods. So this is really like showing the underlying risk of floods. So and the goal of these, you know, static maps. Uh, sorry. Absolutely. I was actually switching on the other browser. So that's, sorry. Um, so that's actually the introduction to the, um, that I was talking before. So we are in Niger 2022. You see here a snapshot from, uh, um, the, uh, the situation report published in uh, December. This is the timeline in one region, the Dosso region of Niger. Here you see the timeline with the flood season highlighted. So let's now go back and see and build, you know, on this timeline, um, the, um, the actual tools that we have at our disposal. Um, sorry for a mistake. I have two screens and I was switching on the other one. Okay. This is what, what I was talking about. Baseline static maps really like showing the underlying risk of flood. So, this is information that is available throughout the year. The goal of these maps is to highlight the areas that are prone to floods. This is really like looking at the overall risk. So the, that's the information they provide. And the lead time, you know, these are static. So this is not really related to a specific season or a specific forecast, you know, for the upcoming uh, flood season. So, and, you know, and this is usually, you know, something that can be useful for, you know, preparedness planning, but also for disaster risk reduction activities, because from these maps, we can already get a sense of what are the main, you know, like regions or locations, particularly at risk based on past observations. 
And just as an example, you see that this is, for instance, from the World Bank um, Global Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, a risk map, right? So this is at the, what you see on the map is, you know, a map of Niger, where by region, you see the average number of people exposed to floods on a yearly basis. So that's really like, on average, how many people are exposed to floods? And by the way, if you compare this to, you know, what you have seen earlier in the actual assessment for 2022, you see that from this type of maps, you, we can already like understand that it's mainly, you know, the southern part uh, of the country that is, uh, uh, that is available. So if we need to invest in disaster risk reduction preparing, we already, you know, have a tool that is static, you know, it's not really telling us when the floods will happen, but it's telling us at least where, you know, what are the priority areas. So that's the first sort of like tool that we want to introduce, um, you know, today. You see in the timeline that, you know, this is available throughout the year. So it's not really, you know, uh, related to, you know, a specific forecast that is produced at a given moment uh, in time. Okay, now we get closer to, uh, uh, to the flood season. So, and that's when, um, sorry, I went too far, we start having seasonal outlooks. And I'm sure that many, um, on, you know, many people on this call have received bulletins from, you know, the regional met, uh, meteorological centers like the PRESAS or ACMA and so on, on sort of like, you know, produce during the spring or, you know, a few months before the beginning of the, uh, of the season, giving an indication, an outlook really of what is the overall like trend, right, for the uh, upcoming season. So these are, first of all, not static, but they are dynamic risk maps. Um, so showing, you know, and specifically the type of information that is provided, you know, uh, will be discussed um, in a moment. But the key takeaway for you would be that these are dynamic, but still we, uh, we need to uh, take into account that this is not really like predicting a specific flood, but more like predicting, you know, the overall risk. So from this type of, you know, seasonal outlooks, we can um, understand if the season will be above average, below average, what is the most likely scenario and, and so on. So the lead time for this type of forecast is, you know, between uh, uh, two, four months out, it depends specifically on the, uh, on the tool. And these, you know, are already things that, you know, we want to use uh, already for more or less like emergency preparedness activities and really like getting a sense of, you know, like, you know, in addition to the baseline risk, you, you know, if this risk is actually, um, you know, uh, materializing in the, in the season that is, that is coming. Okay, so back to 2022. So what did we know? Um, and I took June as sort of like um, you know, a timeline. So just as a reminder, the peak of the floods was actually pretty late. So it was at the end of September, if not the beginning of uh, October. But what we knew back then, I took one seasonal rainfall forecast that's the one you see on the uh, on the left. That's you know just as an example from uh, Columbia University uh, IRI. So that's a three months seasonal forecast issued in June. You know and showing the you know the most likely uh, category of rainfall. And again, you know we're talking here about terra size, and we discussed three weeks ago. Um, specifically how to interpret these maps. And we can also share the, uh, the recordings and the material for those that are interested. But what we knew was that the season was expected to be, you know, above average. So there was a higher probability for the season to be in the upper 33%, you know, if we look at, um, you know, the rainfall distribution historically. But also at the beginning of June, that was still really early on. We had the initial... Uh, seasonal outlooks, you know, not you know, not projecting rainfall, but projecting the risk of, you know, high, medium, and low uh, flows. And I put here on the left as, you know, a screenshot of what 
um, the, the GLOFAS seasonal forecast, that is, you know, a forecast that is producing sort of like, you know, an outlook is telling the tendency for, you know, two to four months uh, out uh, for the main, the main data. So we knew back in June that, you know, the seasonal forecast was not yet anticipating the big floods during the end of the, the year, but still we knew already that the season was on average, if not um, um, above. Now, let's get closer to the rainy season. We have, you know, we have, we start having flood forecasts that become available. And these are the forecasts that Tani introduced earlier. So the information that is provided by this forecast is really like projection of water flow based on input rainfalls or, you know, the, all the different modeling approaches that we uh, have heard. And this is really like looking at a specific point on a specific river basin and you know making projections over the next and you look at the lead time one week two weeks at best usually these models tend you know tend to perform better in long and you know on big river basins for shorter river basins this is um you know much harder actually uh, to um, uh, you know, to have higher skills. So these models, you know, are then already the models that provide, you know, specific information on an event likely to happen in the near future. We are talking about, you know, in two weeks, 10 days, or, you know, a week. Um, so, and these are the type of inputs that we can start using, you know, to inform anticipatory action, to inform emergency response, or to eventually, you know, some of the contingency planning. Now, let's go back. Um, I said, you know, like that the peak of the floods was around the end of September. So I took a snapshot of what GLOFAS, that is the global model that has been introduced earlier, was actually predicting on the 15th of September. So we are, you know, mid-September. We know that the flood, the peak was actually, you know, a little later, but, you know, I took, you know, two weeks earlier, the end of the month as a, a reference point. So what you see on this graph uh, on the right is, you know, the, the standard uh, prediction that you would get from GLOFAS. So this is, you know, relative to a specific station. In this case, is the station in uh, uh, Niamey uh, in uh, Niger. And here you see the dates. It's a little hard to, to read, but you see here is the 15th of September, and this is the end of September. So this is basically, you know, 15, uh, 15 days, the, the time between uh, the two. Now, um, we um, also, so what we see in the graph is, that's the Y axis, is um, the uh, projected discharge. So this is really like how much water is expected to flow in this uh, in this rig. And that's really like measured in cubic meters per second. But what you see also are the different colors. So the green color means a 1.5 year return period flow. Then you have the two year return uh, period, five in uh, uh, red, and then, well, you don't see here in this, uh, um, graph the purple one that is the 20th. But what, from GLOFAS, we we have we knew or the, what GLOFAS was uh, anticipating was that for roughly a week the flow would have stayed you know roughly constant or slow rise, and then we would have seen a sharp rise you know going into sort of like you know the roughly the 1.5 two year return period. And then the situation would have been, you know, um, would have gotten even, you know, worse in terms of stream flow, you know, at, towards the, you know, the first week of October. So this, you know, becomes really like information that is very dynamic and that can be definitely, you know, useful, you know, going back to the question from William for informing humanitarian actions. Just, you know, as a warning, this is what was produced on the 15th of September. GLOFAS, you know, is updated on a daily basis. So, you know, and that's exactly sort of like another key aspect that these type of forecasts are dynamic. So they change pretty much, you know, every day and they are updated continuously on the basis of the, the latest information. 
The last tool, you know, and this is now during the, the, the rainy season, is observational data. So, and this is really like, these are measurements, but still already looking at measurements could be useful to inform humanitarian response. So we are talking here about the state, the specific measurements from the stations of water flow or flood extent from satellites, for instance. And this is usually data that is available on real time. So this is a snapshot really like saying sort of like, what are the regions affected, you know, and so on. So, and the use for this, you know, type of inputs is definitely for, you know, prioritizing in emergency response or early impact assessments if, you know, access is difficult and so on. And there are, you know, different data providers. And again, as an example, you see what UNOSAT did at the beginning of October 2022. So, this is a map that has been uh, uh, published on the 7th of October. And the actual uh, satellite data is from the 5th um, of, of October and basically shows the, uh, the flood extent. So the, the, you know, the red uh, band is basically, you know, showing the, you know, the locations that have been, uh, have been flooded. And, you know, this was available 48 hours, you know, after the, uh, the peak of the flood. So definitely, you know, to get an understanding of the regions mostly affected and so on. Uh, is definitely, uh, you know, useful information. And so, um, yeah, so and we wanted to really like show you sort of like how you can sort of like combine, you know, the information that is available at different time scales with also like, you know, like different features to, you know, to inform the different phases of, uh, um, of humanitarian response. So let me, um, you know, pause for a moment to see if there are questions. I see that, you know, in the chat, there's already like a, a discussion going on between uh, uh, Tanya specifically on, you know, the specific use, but let me maybe pause for a moment. And first of all, ask, you know, at this stage, if either Tanya or Gray, you have um, a comment uh, on this, um, or, you know, on this part, and maybe we can just keep, you know, like the, uh, the the full timeline here. If not, I think we can move then to the to the last part of the of the webinar. So no comments from Gray, Tanya. So um, uh, thank you, Leonardo, for this um, um, presentation. So to, I don't have to, uh, a big comment on that, but. Uh, um, I would like to emphasize that uh, um, it's very important to understand in the, uh, the dynamic of a basin. So to, uh, the leak time uh, response and uh, uh, all flow forecasting need to be focused or structured based on the dynamic. We have several products that are available um, globally, so but uh, it needs to be adequate also to the dynamic of a specific a specific river basin. So, to, and uh, you was also talking about seasonal forecasting. So, to, uh, I think that that is the, uh, really important to have a vision about uh, what is the trending of a, um, of a river uh, for a few days. It helps people also to prepare actions to, before that the event arrive. That is critical, especially for humanitarian actions. Great, thank you very much. So I don't see um, other questions in the chat. So let's move to the to the last part and make sure you have access to the to the chat because there will be, you know, a number of like questions and we ask you to to provide inputs on. OK, so now. Let's do a little exercise. So we're asked you to imagine that you are the newly appointed climate data focal point for Niger. We have learned a lot about Niger and the tools that we have available. And you need to provide recommendations. You need to advise partners on uh, emergency preparedness for um, the, uh, the upcoming season. So we have some questions and please, you know, put your, you know, reactions or you know like uh, inputs or you know answers in the in the chat so first you know scenario is 
Let's imagine that now is 2023. We have seen what happened in 2022 in Niger, but now it's January. So we are, you know, really still far away from the rainy season. So um, now it's January. The two inputs that you have is, you know, the situation report, you know, this is another situation report from OCHA. So basically showing, you know, what happened in uh, 2022. You have the same, you know, baseline risk map that, you know, uh, I explained before from uh, uh, the World Bank. So already like back in January, without sort of like, you know, forgetting for a moment about what you know, you know, right now about the, um, you know, the upcoming uh, season, what type of recommendations you would be able to provide just based on this information. So let's imagine it's January and you want to provide, you know, a recommendation for preparedness, for flood preparedness in Niger, just based on this information. What is, for instance, something you, you, can, you can recommend to partners? And just, you know, like put your uh, comments in the, in the chat or, you know, answer. So let's try to make it a bit, uh, uh, a bit dynamic. So, and I will be uh, reading to everyone your, your questions. Don't be shy, there are no wrong answers. So while people type their answers, uh, maybe Tanya, can I ask you? Yeah, I see you raise your hand. So I was about yes. to ask you, so what would be your recommendation? Maybe, Just based on this. maybe to, to, to motivate the participation of our colleagues, uh, could you reformulate again the question? So the question is really like really early before you have any additional information available, just by looking at you know what happened in previous years, the baseline risk maps, you know what type of recommendations, what kind of insights you can extract from uh, you know like this type of you know this type of maps, in terms of like either I don't know scale or priority areas and so on. Is there already something you can say about more like yeah how to inform flood response in Niger already back in? in general, just based on this. Okay, so the, uh, because you want to inform in January about uh, what is going to happen uh, in the flow season using this information. Yes. So I understood well. So the, um, so the, in January, in Niger, normally uh, we are no uh, initiating the uh, rainy season. So we don't know exactly what is going to be uh, the behavior of the, in the catchment uh, in this time. So for me, it's quite early to provide uh, uh, with guidance orientation for uh, uh, the rainy season. So the, using this information from January. So the well is unique to provide any recommendation. So the, you can uh, uh, maybe indicate that uh, um, so we need to monitor uh, the conditions, especially uh, in Niger, because in Niger we have the, uh, the the impact are major based on this information that you have. Right. Yeah. So in Niger and also in Ofa. Ofa. So it's true that you know, and that's exactly why I took January because we're very far away from the uh, the rainy season. So and I see that William is already like putting some elements that we can we can use to know about you know dynamics of floods in Niger. So even and that's the key you know point that I want you to take away. Even really like early on before the flood season, we have some tools to know what should what are the areas mostly at risk of floods. So if we need to invest in, you know, preparedness plans or, you know, like, you know, risk reduction and so on, we already have a sense without having access 
to you know to the specific forecast information for the upcoming season that are not yet available in January. What are the regions, the locations that are that we should prioritize for I don't know training and preparedness planning and where we should really make sure that we have contingency plans for floods available. So that's you know sort of like the you know already something that you can. Uh, you can get from this, um, you know, this type of um, um, of maps. Okay, let's go um, closer to the uh, to the flood season. Now, and that's you know the latest um, uh, forecast from uh, uh, Pressas released by Pressas and uh, Ahmad. So, the map on the on the right is a seasonal forecast for June. July, August. This has been released in uh, uh, on the seventh of uh, uh, of June, and it's basically saying that you know across the Sahel, the upcoming season um, will be um, you know on average, if not you know above. So that's you know where you see uh, uh, the green uh, color on the on the map. So. The first question that you know I have for you uh, all is, um, what does you know an average or above average season? That is actually the forecast that we have right now for uh, the season. Um, mean for um, uh, for the risk of floods, right? So can you already say something? about you know the risk of floods based on this you know seasonal forecast what would be your your guess so if i want to reformulate the you know the the, the you know the question and that's the the discussion point would be so what you see on the right is, you know, a precipitation forecast. Is this enough, basically, to say that there will be, you know, a high risk of floods in the upcoming season? And maybe, you know, I may ask you, um, I don't know, Gray or Tanya to may, you know, maybe just comment on this. So the question would be, what can we conclude from this? Is this already like enough? Or you know, it's still early. We need to. What are the actions that maybe? You okay. know, what are the main? I'm things? a bit familiar with this type of seasonal forecast uh, in the region. So to, um, the information provides you um, a trendy, at regional level. So, to, but uh, normally, how countries are using this information? So the regional centers, Atmat and Agrimetra, who are at, uh, uh, developing this information, they are also meeting with countries to, uh, to adequate this regional information to the national condition. So, to, um, so if uh, I need to replay your question, no, this information is not enough to uh, uh, suggest some strategy at country level. So, to, um, uh, in West Africa, uh, countries to, so they are using observations to adequate uh, uh, this information. They are using observation from the last uh, uh, rainy seasons. So to estimate uh, the level of the um, reservoir. So to, um, what I could like to suggest is that this uh, uh, future approach as the, the approach that uh, a great uh, uh, present and also other time of approach like GeoGlobe or Fanfare, etc. So it comes to a better war with countries. So to, to adequate uh, um, hydrological forecasting to better take decisions. Great, thank you. But I could like also to hear from some, some colleagues who are here, where we're but Great. Any yes. questions or because I know from the uh, humanitarian side or disaster reduction, so I, I'm more 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 focused on the hydrometeorological actions. So I would like to see how they can use how they can can interpret this kind of information. 
Yeah, so there's actually a comment from Martina. Uh, so yeah, what she's saying is that, yeah, that's, you know, and I very much agree with what you just said. That was exactly my, um, my point. So the, this, you know, forecast is a rainfall forecast aggregate, you know, is an aggregated three months rainfall forecast that is saying that the season will be normal. If not above the 1 on the right is not a flood forecast. And that's really like the, what I want you to, you know, take away. So this, you know, means that the seed, you know, the season will be on average or above. It doesn't say anything about the distribution of rainfall, you know, throughout the season. It doesn't say anything about you know, excess of rainfall in specific, you know, days or weeks that may cause floods. So it's true that it's saying that, you know, the trend, the outlook is more, you know, for, you know, a wet or normal season than, you know, like a dry season. So that's, you know, sort of like to some degree, it's sort of like, you know, a first alarm bell that is possible, but it's definitely not enough to just say that, you know, there will be uh, there will be um, significant floods. Okay, just in the interest um, of time, I think um, I would like to then go straight to the last uh, the last part of the of the presentation. So the only thing I want to show you um, is that right now we have, and I'm going straight to this slide. Um, this is what Glofas and the Google model and i have seen also like the other models are saying for the moment so for the next week or so the um the flow is expected to be low right so you see that is very much you know below the warning level on the right you see uh, the google model on the uh, left the glowfast uh, model you see that is you know very very low flow but the other thing that i want to point your you know attention to is the fact that as we go, you know, away, you know, as we increase the lead time, then also the uncertainty bands, you know, from these models increase. So these models are actually saying that, you know, with a reasonable uncertainty, let's say in this time range, that is roughly, you know, a week or what, 10 days, you know, you see the error bar. So that's really like the spread in the, uh, in the predictions of the water flow. You see, you know, that they are pretty contained. Well, they really get larger and larger. And that's, you know, also like what uh, Gray was, you know, telling us before about sort of like, you know, how, what is the maximum lead time that we can, uh, uh, that we can expect from this model. So really like well, one thing would be, let's always be careful also about the, inter the uncertainty bars and sort of like also, which is, you know, uh, closely linked to the uh, to the uh, the skills of the forecast. Okay, last point. We have you know two minutes left, and I want to do this last um, rapid fire type of questions. Simple questions. You need to select one forecast. So let's imagine it's December. And you're requested to provide recommendations on how well and where we need to spend some funding from development actors to reduce flood risk. The season is, you know, then in July, but you want to reduce flood risk. So what is the forecast? You know, the tool that you would use, you would use baseline risk maps, seasonal or, you know, hydrological flood forecast or observational data. Just drop the a link. In the chat baseline risk map exactly for several reasons because it's december we don't know what is you know coming in uh, uh you know during the uh the rainy season so yeah great now it's august so we are in uh, uh you know in in the middle of the rainy season and now we want to know more like in the next sort of like couple of months what is sort of like, what are the regions at the highest risk of floods? What type of tools would you use? More like the baseline risk maps, the seasonal or the flood? Yes. So it's a, definitely that's something you can get from the flood forecast. They don't go up to two months, right? So it's more like we said two weeks and, uh, and so on. Some information can become available already from 
the seasonal forecast. But of course, the uncertainty would be high. So in here, you get a sense of you know where the risk is concentrated. Now, very operational. We need to set up uh, an early warning system for evacuating you know a specific displacement site in uh, uh, close to the Niger River. So what type of forecast we would uh, we would use? Seasonal. Do we all agree with William? I would say I would rely more on flood forecast. Exactly. So maybe, you know, you can get some indications early on, but really like evacuations usually happen really like with short lead times. That's really like an emergency measure. And you want to use the best and most reliable forecast that you have, you know, two, three days in advance to then inform uh, this type of, uh, of actions. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think that's it for um, what I, yeah, I think we're running out of time. Last one. Now, similar to, you know, the, the first question. Now we, need, we, don't, we want to provide recommendations on where to build a new warehouse, right? And we don't want the warehouse to be this, you know, uh, destroyed, right? So what should we use in this case? So this is something that we want to build, right? And this will stay there. So definitely seasonal, but also we want to make sure that the location where we build this new warehouse will not be at risk. So definitely also using the baseline risk maps are, um, uh, you know, is telling us. And of course, you know, like, well, I see uh, on uh, uh, local knowledge. Yes, definitely. That's you know always something that we should use to complement the models with. Okay, I think um, I'll stop sharing my screen. We'll be um, sharing the presentations, um, the the slides, and let me you know say a huge thanks to Tanya and to Gray for being with us today. Um, and yeah, if you have, you know, further questions, just feel free to reach out. We'll send, you know, in a few days, the recording together with the slides and we are, you know, very, uh, happy to hear back from you. You know, if you found this useful, what are some of the, uh, elements that you would like to learn more? Thank you very much. And thank you again, Tanya and Gray for joining today. Thank you.